this. Can we finish by going back to where we started in first uh, chapter of Second Peter? And this is the chapter which really nails down for us the importance of prophecy. And tells us that prophecy is the p power of God driving forward those prophets to speak God's word. In contrast to the false prophets and false teachers. So we've been called upon to discriminate between true teaching and false teaching. To rightly divide the word of truth. And what we want to look at now is... and. To make sure that our understanding of prophecy, which, which should grow and grow and develop, is a force in our lives to prepare us for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's one thing to be interested. You know, I get the milestones, uh, uh, emails and, and so on. And I'm, I'm really interested. And, you know, we have some really good talks in, in mumbles on prophecy because there's quite a few uh, brethren who are really interested and yeah it's always interesting and exciting what difference does it make and what second peter chapter one is saying <coughs> if we work backwards so the end of the chapter is about the importance of prophecy then we work backwards and really it's talking about verse 11 an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord. But those who enter into that kingdom. Look back to verse 9. Are not those who are blind. And cannot see afar off. And what the apostle is trying to tell us is. That we have to develop spiritual qualities. That are an essential part of our entrance into the kingdom of God. So verse 5 says, Give diligence, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what we're talking about is wholeness here. You know, there isn't a spiritual life and then there's interest in prophecy. Yeah. Prophecy is part of the spiritual life, part of the power to drive us forward. <coughs> so we start in verse 5 with faith. So, of course, we, we believe these things. But into our faith, we have to develop virtue, spiritual qualities. And that comes uh, out of a growing in knowledge. So verse 5 says, and to virtue, knowledge. So we have faith, we believe, but then we have to develop our characters. And that's going to be developed through increasing knowledge. But it's not a head knowledge. It's a, a knowledge that comes uh, through an acquaintance, a, a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ uh, and knowing him the more we know him the better we know him the more we're going to be like him and then verse 6 to knowledge temperance temperance is power over ourselves and we've talked a lot about that I think and in the discussion groups you know we're, we're in an addictive age an addictive society you know and and the the uh, Capitalist system wants us to consume. It wants us to be addicted to whatever it is. It wants us to keep buying more of what we like, and it's targeting us. We know. We know it happens. You know, you go onto Google and you look up something. I'm going to buy. I want to buy. You know, a kitchen uh, equipment or something, and you find the next day all these adverts keep coming into whatever you're looking at quite separately, advertising. New shoes or whatever you were looking at yesterday. <clears throat> so they know us and they're targeting us because they want us to be addicted to these things. So temperance is the opposite. Temperance is self-control. Te temperance is power over ourselves and our feelings and our emotions. 
And to that, patience is not just, you know, being able to say no or stopping doing things. We've got to keep on. We've got to be patient because these tests may go on and on and on. And, and they may last much longer than we think is reasonable. You know, it seems unfair that some brothers and sisters have so much trouble, it never goes away. It seems to get worse. So it is a test of patience. And of course, patience, long, long, long <laughs> challenges can make us bitter. They can make us bitter and twisted. They, they can make our personalities harsh uh, and unkind. But patience has to then go less godliness. So this patience is not just uh, enduring. It is enduring in the right spirit. And then, verse 7, brotherly kindness. So the picture is of, of, uh, of someone who is baptized believer who wants to develop the Christ-like character, who searches the scriptures, trying to grow in knowledge, um, who uh, practices self-control in their lives, says, no, no, not doing that, or that's enough of that, whatever, uh, and is then tested by repeated problems and, and has to develop a character through patience, but not to become bitter, but become more like Christ through that. And kind <laughs> when opportunity arises. Now we'll know people like that. Uh, we'll know older people like that who've gone through a hard life and who are kind and gentle and loving. Now there are other, other options. <laughs> there are other paths. But that's what, that's, that's the, uh, the picture that Second Peter chapter 1 is. And if these things are in us, then the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a threat to us. It's not a fear for us. It's, it's going to be the most wonderful thing ever. And the nearness of that, uh, through the word of prophecy, is enforced upon us. That's why this is such an important subject. I'd like us to turn to Luke chapter 18 now to look at a verse, consider a verse there, that is sometimes quoted as a negative, which... Um, sometimes is taken to imply that ecclesias will die out before the Lord Jesus Christ comes. And it's a question in Luke chapter 18 and verse 8, which says, I, uh, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And sometimes this is taken to be, well, no, well, he's not going to, is he? So all these negative things that are happening in the ecclesial world, well, it's inevitable. That's the way it's going to be. Uh, you know, there's no point resisting it. It's a, it's a welcome sign of the times. <laughs> well, it's not a welcome sign of the times, is it? Uh, and I think the answer is, will the Son of Man find faith? It's an answer for us to give. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we can, in some ways, answer ourselves. Some are giving up faith. That's true. Some lose faith. Some have their faith undermined by false teaching that comes in through the internet. That's why we're so concerned about it. It's not that, you know, ooh, you're old-fashioned, you're only standing up for the ideas of uh, a past generation. We're interested in, in, in when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith in the earth? And I think there will be a presence. And when, when we talk about ecclesias in decline, we're only talking about Britain. We have a very parochial attitude when we talk about these things, right? Yes, ecclesias are shrinking uh, in some parts of Britain, but not in others. Mumble is expanded. Uh, the kingdom is expanding. You know? yeah. it's, it's, not a, it's not in a, every, every part. And then things happen like you know, our Iranian brethren and sisters coming in. Who predicted that? Who planned that? 
What Bible mission activity was that? None at all. God's word will accomplish the purpose to which he sends it. So we can rest on that. We can trust that. Oh, it's been a, tra you know, a, a, a set of uh, terrible events in Africa, in Mozambique and, and Malawi and so on, and flooding of, and, uh, and uh, cyclones and so on, during which it said we have 20,000 Christadelphians in Mozambique. We have more in Mozambique than in Britain. Did you know? Did you, first of all, did you know it was a place called Mozambique? <laughs> and did you know there were any Christadelphians there? And then you find out it's more than in Britain. Who did that? Right, so, you know, we can't be parochial about this. When the Son of... It, it, the word will accomplish its purpose. It's for us to be faithful to that word and to stand up for that word and to, to, to help one another. So that will take us to chapter seven, 16 of Revelation because verse 15 of Revelation 16, the sixth fire exhortation, implies that there will be Christadelphians at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't it? It implies there will be because these frog-like spirits, the spirits of demons working miracles, are going forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather into the battle of the great day of God Almighty. While that's going on, verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And so that, that implies that when the Lord comes, there are those who are going to give account. So we're going to look a bit more closely at that now, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity of uh, just going into chapter 17 and realising how exciting it is, the times in which we're living. I'm not going to talk about Brexit, but it, you know, it's part of that whole picture to realise what's going on in Europe and how amazing that is in regard to the times in which we live. So I put this up to encourage everyone to develop a framework, you know, to keep some sort of picture in the minds of how these things uh, are going to progress. And just going on to where are we today then? Well, we are living in the age of Heket, <laughs> the goddess of unclean spirits like frogs. But there's also this scarlet beast and the harlot system in chapter 17, which is developing as we live in chapter 16. <coughs> Let's go into chapter 17 then and see there the description. Most of us will know it pretty well. In chapter 16, the Holy Roman Empire has been dismembered by the vile judgments. And yet, in chapter 17, here is this woman riding the beast. The beast is it's back on the sea. And yet, yet it's been uh, hammered in the previous chapter. And I think the answer is back there uh, in chapter 17, verse 17 and 18. Well, verse, verse 16 and 17, sorry, verse 16 and 17 of chapter 17. These verses at the end seem rather odd. They seem out of place. They seem to not quite uh, make sense as you go through this. Uh, a reference there to the, the war that the ten horns make with the, with the lamb and so on. Uh, and the whore, it says in verse 15, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth, the peoples and multitudes, nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh. So hang on, the ten horns are destroying the whore. How does that fit into this picture that we've got? Well, I think the best suggestion is that verses uh, 16 and 17 is a reference back to chapter 16. You know, I'm not saying it's strictly chiastic, but the concept of chiasm 
where a later verse is actually referring back to an earlier section, uh, allows us, if you like, the freedom to consider the possibility that what we're getting at the end of chapter 17 is in fact a commentary on what we've read in chapter 60. Is that confusing enough? Yeah. <laughs> I think what it is, in, in, uh, in English uh, uh, printing, you'd have footnotes or end notes, right? Uh, and you read the page and then you say, you know, little, little y, go down to little y in the footnote and you'd read little y and, you'd, uh, and that's the way you do it. You'd go back and forth and I think that's what we get here. We're, we are going back and forth because they didn't have footnotes or end notes, but that's what this is. Verses 16 and 17 is an end note to the vials. What happened in the vials is that the ten kings of Europe or the ten horns, devoured the woman. The Catholic Church lost her preeminence in Europe from Napoleon onwards. She was stripped of her papal states. Uh, the church uh, became a pauper, relatively. The Pope was displaced, uh, you know, uh, wasn't living in Rome. And then, in the, in the 1900s, this beast is coming back into existence again with the woman riding the beast. I think that's, that's how that works. So what we're seeing in chapter 17 is, at the time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, there is a beast and there is a woman riding the beast. Why is she not part of the beast? Well, because she has lost her temporal power. She, she, she lost her role as the beast sister. She was stripped of that. Uh, and she, there's a spiritual force controlling the beast. And the identification of the woman and the beast is very, very, very interesting. So the beast has seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. And the woman is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. For the life of me, I cannot understand why there's any argument about uh, who this woman is or, or who the beast is, because, you know, you haven't got many options. You know, mm, you know exactly. it's no. not as if there are some really difficult choices to make. <laughs> it's that spirit again, work, working so that you can't identify it. It's deceiving you. That's why there's so many options. So the seven hills, if you said, you know, which city has got seven mountains, right? You don't have to be, uh, um, you know, a scholar of history to find that out. Everybody knows Rome's, the, the city built on seven hills. But then I know people have said to me, ah, oh, yeah, but, you know, there are a lot of other cities built on seven hills. And, and one brother facetiously said to me a long time ago, yeah, and Swansea's built on seven hills. <laughs> and anyway, anyway, Rome isn't built on seven hills. There's more hills than seven in Rome. But the point, point is that this is the way Rome was pictured in the heraldry of the time. When John was given the revelation, there would have been not a shadow of a doubt which city sat upon seven hills. And if somebody said, oh yeah, but one of them isn't a very big hill, and, uh, and today if you drive around Rome, there aren't any hills left, because you know, the valleys have been filled in with the rubbish of years, does that nullify the fact that this was known as the city built on seven hills? If you Wikipedia cities built on seven hills, you will find dozens of them. But why will you find dozens of them? Because they're all trying to copy Rome. They're all trying to be the city. <laughs> they're, they're emulating Rome. So it's not an argument against it being Rome. It's an argument for it being Rome, that there are other cities. That Constantinople apparently was built on seven hills. Isn't a coincidence? Because if you're going to set up a new capital, what would you like it to be? You'd like it to be a city built on seven hills, wouldn't you? So everybody would say, oh yeah, Rome's power is transferred to Constantinople. Because the city built on seven hills is quintessentially what Rome was. 
Now, you know, you can knock me down if you will, but um, I'll just fall down. You don't have to knock me down if you can give me the evidence. <laughs> right. So, if you were, uh, you know, let, okay, let's get erudite. Let's go to Cambridge and let's go to Cambridge University Press and let's ask them what they think of the Seven Hills of Rome. It's the signature of an eternal city. That's what it is. Seven may be a symbolic number for others besides the scriptural. Uh, symbolism, right? Uh, the, the idea of seven to, to the Latins might have itself signified eternal. They wanted to represent Rome as the eternal city. It's built upon seven hills. It's the signature of Rome. Why do you think the Lord has chosen to reveal the symbolism in that way? It's like the, the the lion with eagle's wings was the signature of the Assyrian Empire. So there she is, Roma, sitting upon seven hills. In chapter 17, she's riding a beast. And again, this is something which is pretty fundamental and pretty obvious. A woman riding, excuse the some of these are from museums uh, around the world this is from Vienna in Austria and they're all on the same theme and what do they represent? a woman riding a scarlet coloured beast they represent Europe ah, that's her name, Europa riding the bull of Zeus and what happens is that Zeus was the god of the Ro Greeks and Romans and he was uh, an inveterate liar and seducer. And he changed his shape and he seduced women. And he seduced this woman, uh, the daughter of Phoenician king. He captured her and took her from the coast of Palestine to Crete. And from Crete uh, a dynasty was formed which was the foundation of European civilization. So if you've ever visited Crete on holiday, it's not a, not a huge place. You think, is it so important? Yeah, actually, it was the beginning of European civilization. And that's how Europa's name came to come stand for Europe itself. So it's an amazing, a woman riding a beast is identified as Europa. And you can see there uh, in a mosaic uh, from France. And you can see it again uh, in other representations. It's all the same theme, the woman riding the beast. Now tell me, when John receives this, and these are also first century round about there, these pictures. Do you think there was any doubt to those at the time of John? Uh, do you think they would have said, oh, I don't know what city this is that rules over the kings of the earth and is sat on seven hills? Beats me, I don't know what that could be. And, and this, this woman riding a beast? No, they're going to say, got it, got it, yeah, I know, I know what's going on. Here. Right? Come. So there's Crete. And it's interesting, of course, it's part of Greece. Uh, the Europe uh, riding the bull is on the Greek euro, two euro coin. So the, the symbolism has continued. And what chapter 17 verse 13 is telling us <coughs> is very, very interesting. That the ten kings, the ten representative nation states which grew up on the Roman territory at the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ are going to give their power to the beast to the empire right this Roman system this Roman empire is going to be created in a unique way and that I think this is something you know we can use when we talk to people trying to preach the truth or whatever right what is so special about Revelation 17 verse 13 is this. These have one mind and shall give their power. They shall give it. In, throughout history, the 
you know, the conquest of nations was a matter of force. Nations didn't volunteer to give up their power. They didn't give up sovereignty. They tried to pr protect their sovereignty and to expand their reach. And they fought each other for it. But this empire is made up of willing contributors. <coughs> we will give up our sovereignty. That's the most astonishing thing. To give their power and strength unto the beast. So, isn't that amazing? Now, those terms, like uh, authority and giving, is what the European Union is based on. That's why I think it's so interesting. So, what should we expect? We've done this with the other prophecies, and it's always helpful, I think. You know, we're trying to keep a scriptural perspective. We're not, we're not looking at the newspaper cuttings first. We're, we're looking at scripture. What would we expect to happen from scripture, from this chapter? So the Roman system in Europe to continue in some form for 2,000 years. Huh? That's what we've expected. The empire to be subdivided into nation states. There are ten kings. That's what we would have expected. These nations, not expected, to voluntarily give their sovereignty to the empire for a brief period. Now that's what Brexit is about, isn't it? Whether Britain retains or, or, or takes back its sovereignty or whether it remains and, and gives more sovereignty to Europe. That the new United States of Europe to preside it over by a woman drunk with the blood of the states. Even, even if you didn't know she was the great city that ruled over the kings of the earth, even if you knew she was sitting on, didn't know she was sitting on seven hills, once you're told she's drunk with the blood of the saints, you know there is only one possibility. Right? You've got a threefold cord, haven't you, to, to identify her. And once you have identified her, you can't duck away from the implications of that. You can't say, oh, why are you always attacking the Catholics? We're not attacking the Catholics. They're attacking us. <laughs> She's drunk with the blood of the saints. That's why it's a pretty good idea to identify who she is. That's the United States of Europe to be expected. And notice this, Europe's to be ready to make war when Christ comes. Why do I say that? Well, because it says in chapter 17, verse 14, these shall make war. These shall make war with the Lamb. So the United States of Europe, created by the willing giving of sovereignty to the central power, presided over by the Catholic Church or the papacy, is going to have to have the capacity to make war. That's our expectation. You think, oh, you've read that off the newspapers. It's our expectation from the chapter. And, you know, uh, uh, the Milestone series for 50 years, I think it's almost gone on for 50 years, isn't it? It's, uh, uh, and the Bible magazine been saying these things and pointing out that Brother Thomas said. See, this is what Brother Thomas said. Eureka, 1861. They will prepare war and wake up their mighty men. The ten horn royalties of the European Commonwealth. He said that in 1861. The European Commonwealth will make war with the Lamb. The European Commonwealth. Now it's an amazing uh, conclusion drawn from the text of Scripture, not from anything else. He's not commenting on the world that he sees it. He's saying, what I read there is a European Commonwealth. Ten kingdoms giving their sovereignty in order that they might make war with the Lamb. And Brother Roberts, these last two slides I got from uh, uh, Brother Mike, who, uh, who you know, found, found them, I think they're really amazing. And this is Brother Robert Roberts in Christendom Australia. You know, these are fundamental books, aren't they? Where he says there, Daniel's fourth beast is to be resuscitated at the ear of its destruction. 
are not only resuscitated, but established on the basis of, what a modern phrase, corporate unity. That is to say, the ten kingdoms into which the fourth beast system is to be divided at the end are to unite in a unanimous policy under a single head. Now, he didn't get that from looking at, at, at the, the world in which he was living. The German power was uh, beginning to rise. Uh, there was, uh, the French and the German powers were, were, were coming to war. No, he said, chapter 17 sees a corporate unity based on a unanimous policy under a single head. That's what scripture's asking us to believe. So when, when we find the Treaty of Rome in 1957 beginning this process, we are immensely excited. It's exactly what we would expect. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He is nearly here. This final phase is taking shape. And you think, oh, well, the Pope's not so important. Well, people said that 15 years ago, and they might have thought well, there may have been something in it. Look what's happened since. When <coughs> Europe was celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, because the uh, British Prime Minister's not there now, because Britain has voted to leave, they all went to see the Pope. And they had their photo opportunity in front of the picture, which is the last judgment. Why did they go to see the Pope on their 60th anniversary? Because he is the figurehead for the Treaty of Rome. These treaties, which have been added to, of course, by others, and we particularly notice the Treaty of Lisbon in 2009. When you go to the European Union website, do you know what it's called? Everybody in the room knows what the European Union website's name is? No? The name of the woman riding the beast, right? That's what the European Union website's called. Why do they call it that? Because they want to prove the continuity of what's going on. They want to say this is what had, uh, has been happening over the last... 2,000 years. And this is what Europa says of the European Union. It is a pact between sovereign states. It's almost like quoting Robert Roberts. <laughs> a pact between... But look at it. An age-old value that centres on humanity and human dignity. Humanism, the spirit of the French Revolution, is what binds it together. What about the Catholic Church? This is what the Catholic Church says. The Catholic Church, as a, a, a special group of bishops who are the bishops of the countries in the European Union, and they get together and they lobby and they influence. Right? And uh, so they, they've got a website. Right? Uh, the bishops of Europe have a website in which it says that the signature of the treaties of Rome was the most important and significant event in the modern history of the eternal city. How about that thing? The woman riding the beast. Right. What the Lisbon, uh, Lisbon Treaty did is to create an international presence, both a president of the council and a representative for foreign affairs. So when outside the Brussels uh, EU building, a woman riding the beast statue appeared, apparently it's been taken down now or moved somewhere else, but uh, when it was there, you can see how appropriate it was. When the euro uh, was brought in and it had a woman riding the beast, you can see how important it was. And just quickly, I know you, some of you know this, but when you look at the, the euro, it is unique in world history Right? Why is it unique? The EU has replaced the currencies that were for many of the countries concerned centuries old symbols of their national sovereignty. These shall give their power, their sovereignty to the beast. And the euro epitomizes that. It makes no sense economically, apparently. Right? Countries are going bankrupt silently within the euro zone 
makes sense for what the project is. And when you look at the banknotes of the euro, they've got a, um, a whole, um, hologram, right? A hologram. And do you know where the hologram comes from? It comes from a vase of a woman riding the beast. Right? And so the euro note, which has got this hologram as proof of its identity, proof of its authenticity, think about that, to prove the authenticity of a euro, of pooled sovereignty, you put the picture of a woman's face from Europa riding the beast. You couldn't, couldn't make it up, could you? you couldn't get any better than that. And when on this website, which was to tell young people, a website devoted to young people in Europe to explain to them what's going on, they say it is the image of Europe reinventing itself as the European Union, it appears to be known to pre it appears to have been known to previous ages. Well, yeah, just go around your museums. Yes, it was known, uh, and is the and is in the process of being rediscovered and worked with in our present times. It is the reassurance of continuity. That's one of the things we expect, wasn't it? The con continuity of the Roman system. The reassurance of continuity. New Europe is still old Europe with a long tradition going back to ancient Greece. That's what Europe is trying to tell us it is about. It is absolutely exactly what Revelation 17 uh, is telling us. Now that's happened in my lifetime, right? It's happened in my lifetime. It's, it's, it, it hadn't been happening when we were teenagers uh, in our 20s, moved to Cardiff in... 1983, from then on, has started to, to, to pick up momentum. Oh, how amazingly exciting. What about making war? Well, you know that since Brexit, the talk in France and Germany of a European army has gathered momentum. So you get now headlines about the European army, and it is something which is taking force. A true European army. Now, the European, as it was, the European economic community is now going to have an army. Exactly as Revelation 17 requires. And uh, I think it was uh, just a few months ago, uh, there was a meeting of European leaders to turn ambition, the ambitious vision, of a European defence community into practice. Right? Now, it's not just rhetoric, it's there. So the Lord is almost here. What sort of people should we be there? Look at chapter 16 and verse 15 again. Behold, I come as a thief. You've probably got cross-references to chapter 3. You should do, if you haven't already. If you haven't already, put them in. Right? Because what's happening here is amazing. That the Lord Jesus Christ is wanting to give us an alert, a warning. He's saying, now, when I come, you've got to be ready. And the language he uses is taken from two of the seven letters to the Ecclesias. Just from two of the seven. And the two are Sardis and Laodicea. And you can see that, right? Behold, I come as a thief. Where is that to be found? Chapter 3, verse 3. It's the Sardis warning. Behold, I come as a thief. And Sardis also has... Uh, there are a few names which have not defiled their garments, but they shall walk with me in white. So coming as a thief and garments and walking, that comes from Sardis. You look at the Laodicean le letter, verse 18 of chapter 3. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So the nakedness and shame 
comes from Laodicea. So the Lord has taken two exhortations which were particular for two ecclesias, the Sardis Ecclesia and the Laodicea Ecclesia in the f- first century, the end of the first century. <coughs> and he takes them and puts them together and says, now, you ecclesias in the 21st century, these are what you've got to think about. So the Lord has drawn our attention particularly to Sardis and Laodicea for the lessons there for us in these last days. So what is it about Sardis and Laodicea that is particularly appropriate, pertinent to us and our situation? Let's go visit Sardis in particular. Uh, uh, First of all, Sardis was a famous place. It had a very significant rocky outcrop. So the city was down here, but it was also possible for them to flee to the top of their citadels on the top of this mountain and nobody could attack them with ease. It was easily defended. Unfortunately, it required the soldiers to stay awake to defend the path up to the city. And several times in history, Sardis was captured, although it was uh, impregnable because people had fallen asleep. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. So there's the the citadels on top of the hill. You see how difficult it would be for any soldier to to attack that city, but there's a little path at the back, uh, and if everybody's asleep, the city can still fall. There's another picture of, of Sardis, the city down here and up there. There was an archaeological excavation at Sardis by an American university, and this is taken from uh, a book that I got hold of uh, some while ago now. And it shows the map of the city. And I thought what was particularly interesting was, was that word there. There were two cities in Sardis. There was the city of the living and the city of the dead, the necropolis. And this was a very elaborate city for burying. And these mounds are places where there were uh, mausoleum, or mausolea, mausoleums <laughs> for the dead. So they paid a lot of attention. So, you know, you go down this city and there's the city of the living and there's the city of the dead. Now, what does the Lord Jesus say in Revelation chapter 3? And to the ecclesia, the angel of the ecclesia of Sardis, write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast the name that thou livest and art dead. There were two cities and they were in the necropolis. Spiritually, they were in the necropolis. They were spiritually dead, even though they had a reputation. Now, what was this reputation? You see, it's, it's emphasized, you know. I know thy works, thou hast a name that thou livest. Sardis was renowned. It had a name. It was renowned. This is taken from that uh, a publication. It was an amazing place because it was where lots of major things were invented. Metalwork, coinage, uh, free market, leatherwork, dyeing. It had an international reputation for the production of fabric. They produced a dye, very interesting dye, which was flesh-coloured. This is the place of the flesh. And so they had a a, a reputation for inventing and developing. Amazing reputation. (coughs) And also, if you look at this part, Greek writers used to set their imaginary heroical deeds in Sardis. It was like the, if you imagine, the film set for all the mythology. Things happened in Sardis. They had a name. But by the time the writing of this letter, that was long in the past. But you know people can live on the past, can't they? We can (laughs) live on reputation. You know, we can live on the achievements of our fathers and our grandfathers. We can trade upon it. 
you know. We are this, we are that. And we're nothing of the sort. Because what matters is what we are ourselves. We may have a name that we're spiritually alive, but if we're spiritually dead, it's not going to make any difference that we've got a name that we're spiritually alive. So what we have to make sure of is that we are spiritually alive and that our ecclesias are spiritually alive. <coughs> that, oh, I'm a Christadelphian. Oh, yes, you know, I'm, I'm fifth generation Christadelphian. I am, I am. <coughs> Sixth generation, seventh generation. You know. No, it doesn't count for anything if we're spiritually dead. And that's what the Lord is saying. Don't live on reputation. Be alive. Sardis was captured, <coughs> even though it ought not to have been captured. And so what we have to do, so if you look at verse 2 of Revelation 3, it says, be watchful. That's what prophecy is for. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. What that means is get on and finish the tasks which are not yet complete. We've got jobs to do. We've got young people to train. We've got <coughs> children to educate and nurture. We've got old people to care for and encourage. The work's not finished. Strengthen the things that remain. Keep going. He says, the Lord says to Sardis, I have not found your works perfect. They're not complete. You're incomplete work. If any of us put our hands up and say, we are the finished article? Are we? Is any of us, no matter how old we are, are we the finished article? No. So we have to strengthen the things that remain. And verse 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard <coughs> and hold fast and repent. So it may be, look, Brothers and sisters, verse 3, it may be that we need to repent of something. Doesn't it? Maybe there's something we've got, to, we've got to turn back from. Remember the gospel that we learned when we were baptized and hold fast to that. And if we've drifted away from some of these things, we may need to repent. And the Lord says, if you shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come. It's talking about the watchman of that city that fell asleep when the enemy came. But if we hold fast, and verse 4 says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. White is righteousness. White is the righteousness of faith. And imagine that. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he says... Hello, brother. Hello, sister. Come on in. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Say, well, I'm not worthy. You're clothed in white. Come on in. It's a marvellous thing, isn't it? That there's forgiveness with God, that he may be feared. So then the Lord takes the letter to Laodicea. And he adds some words from his own letter to Laodicea. Well, Laodicea was another rich city like Sardis. The problem with Laodicea was its water supply didn't have good, clean, fresh water. So it piped water down from the hot springs of Hierapolis into the city. And by the time the hot water came down through these pipes, the pipes got furred up with uh, the salts in the water. Those pipes are still evident and the fur in them is still evident because this wasn't good quality drinking water. This was so, like the salt bath water. Time it got down into the city, it was lukewarm. And it was pretty nauseating. It made people sick. Um, apparently it was good for eye salve, but it wasn't beautiful fresh drinking water. And the Lord takes hold of that, doesn't he? And he says to them that they were lukewarm. Verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. And I think what the answer is there, that up in Colossae, there was beautiful, fresh, cold water. You know, you're thirsty. Nothing like cold water. Doesn't matter. Don't put anything in it. <coughs> in a really hot day, just the cold water. You know. So it gives you tepid, salty water. 
Oh. But if he wanted a nice sort of medicinal bath, hot salty water up in Hierapolis hot pools, just a job, all right? So you can see the hot water's good for one thing, the cold water's good for another. You mix them together, yuck. It's not good for anything. And that's what the Laodiceans were. And more than that, the Laodiceans were subject to a self-deception which may be our biggest threat. Like verse 17. <coughs> because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I mean, one of the big things of our age, you know, the spirit of the age, is to big up who we are. You know, to celebrate everybody, to celebrate everything. Little children, when they're put into competitions, everybody must be a winner. Everybody must get the prize, right? Everybody's wonderful, everybody's fantastic, right? Ah, oh, bless them, are oh, they all, right? But, you know, there's a delusion that goes with that. We can grow up thinking we are like that. I am fantastic, you know, yeah, I am really clever, I am, you know, I, I'm really good. Hang on. <laughs> I have need of nothing, and yet thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Well, if we're naked when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, what's going to happen? We're going to be ashamed. It's a reference back to Adam in the garden and Eve in the garden where they hid themselves because they were naked. They were ashamed. They're not going to walk out in the presence of the Lord because they're unclothed. So verse 18 says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. The gold of faith. That's the only thing that's going to matter. Not material possessions. It's the gold of faith which is going to matter. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that thy nakedness do not appear. So the righteousness which is conferred upon us through the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course there's a righteousness which we have to, we have to develop ourselves. When we put on uh, you know, the new man, we have to walk in righteousness. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So the message of these two ecclesias, both brought together into this one verse in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, is of there may be something we need to repent of with the Lord Jesus Christ about to manifest himself to us. And verse 20 is quite powerful. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The Lord may come as a thief in the night. Now, thieves don't knock. But before the Lord comes as a thief, he stands at the door and says, let me in. I'd like to come and sup with you. I'm offering fellowship. And that is the wonderful privilege we have in the truth. Through, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of the book of Revelation that takes away the sin of the world, he's, he's knocking at the door saying, I'm going to come into your house if you let me. Otherwise, I'm going to come as a thief in the night. I know which one I'd rather. So, brothers and sisters, as we consider the uh, prophecy of uh, Revelation, the spirit of the age, in which we live. Let us not be deluded by all the fanciful ideas that it wants to put in our heads. Let us stand fast. Let us hold fast. Let's remember what we have learned and be steadfast in the things of the truth. And then let us go back to our homes, to our ecclesias, to our families, and strengthen the things that remain, enduring patiently till our Lord Jesus Christ comes.